All right, we're going to talk about 5G. Uh, got a crowd here. Uh, between the myth of what 5G is and actually what we're doing in the Air Force, we'll get into some of that. But this is what it basically we're trying to do is we're trying to put 5G everywhere. And there's lots of reasons why. And we'll have to do this manually because of IT things. And of course, this is, happens all the time when I'm here. But that's okay. See, I don't think yeah, I don't think the mic's working. Oh, over here. Yes, sir. This is going to be really hard. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. How many things could possibly go wrong in the presentation? Too many. Okay. Now you can hear me. Now I'm used to walking around, so it's going to be really hard. <laughs> the, uh, what we're going to do is go through some, some things why we want to do this. And basically it's because it's the next generation. We all know that already. And what we're trying to do is look at how can we increase the capacity that we want to for downloading data as well as for everything else associated with the transmission of information. So first of all, 3GPP is the standards body for 5G specifications. Uh, this has been around since 3GPP because it's been third generation. Now it's fourth generation and we're in the fifth generation. Just happens the standards body has been the same for all the generations. So when people talk about 3GPP, it is the standards body for 5G and 5G and 6G and whatever comes after that. DoD is now a member of the, the 3GPP. This is new. DoD didn't never want to be participating in it, but now they feel that they have to participate in it. And so a call is going to be going throughout, throughout the Air Force of having people participate, you know, all this, participate in the meetings. There's about 1,000 meetings a year all over the world. And so there's going to be requests coming out from DUD basically says to us, the Air Force, and to everybody else, who can actually participate in some of these meetings. And it's very key to go to some of these, and they're very specialized meetings. And the reason why we're doing this is because there's an overwhelming presence from China in these meetings. You're going to realize that by now, that they're there they're at every meeting that there is. <laughs> and they host the meetings, host lots of meetings too. And so we are trying to get back into this and saying, hey, we really want to participate in the standards body because we feel it's going to be essential for us to go forward with it. Release 15 is the current release. Its freeze date is, uh, was September 2018. That's a long way, that's well, way back, but people have now, uh, major vendors are now working, generating what comes out of that release in actuality to actually do things. Release 16 is the next one. It's planned for December, I think it's going to be November, and we're going to actually come out and say this is the final release for 16. 16 has a lot of security features in it. We've been looking for 16 for a while. So as we go forward, what you're going to see is some specialization, such as uh, integration to satellites, for instance. Uh, enhancements of how you actually do uh, the, the uh, wavelength frequencies and everything else. And so it's in, in some mobility things as, as well as drones. So understand that the next release is a big release for us because we're going to be participating more in what we want to do and where we want to go into the Air Force. Let's move on. Okay, basically, as you probably realize, 5G is going to have high data rates, reduced latency and higher system capacity. This is the main reasons why. At peak speeds, you know you're going to get a 200% increase in speeds. Now, to do this at peak speeds, you're going to have to have go to the higher frequencies. And this is what you hear about all the time, is the frequency battles that F FA, FCC, and everybody else is having because they're trying to give away spectrum, trying to sell the spectrum. And so you see multiple vendors are at various points in the spectrum. They go back and forth as to what is the high frequencies as well as the low frequencies. In fact, they've been talking, you know, for instance, the cars, automated, well, the car automatics basically is a 5.9 gigahertz frequency. Wow. Everybody else is at the 28 gigahertz frequency. Now they're talking about higher than that. They're talking about the 30s, maybe the 60s. And so you're going to see very high frequencies, and at the same time you're going to see very low frequencies as to what you want to get out of it. The lower frequencies mean you won't get as fast. The higher frequencies mean you get faster. And, then, and the main push is that if you want to do faster, your antennas have to be closer together. So what you're getting for a 5G network, it's basically 
Uh, every lamp pole will have a 5G antenna sitting on it, basically, is what you need. Now, there's some benefits and some problems with this. The benefits are you will get a 5G network, you'll get infinite speeds, not infinite, but pretty close to it. All of a sudden, you'll have everything you want it to do coming into the system. The basic premise behind this is that the new 5G chips actually have beam steering associated with it. And you can have multiple beams. What it means is that a 5G chip sitting on a lamppost can connect to multiple things at the same time and also can transmit information to multiple things at the same time. It can grab things from one beam and push it to another beam. It can do connection connectivity to us, which means that you do not have to have a transmission broadband base at every receiver because they can send information to each other. And so you'll have base receivers various places, but you'll have multiple radio frequency radios coming all over the place that are connectivity. Also, you can see that in some instances, if you're in buildings, you can, the beams can bounce around on the building, it can bounce through the building. They'll be reflected off the walls and bounce around. So when you, when you see some things from the 5G, they'll show, here's a lab, for instance, and we have these multiple antennas, and they'll be tracking the person as they're going through it. And the beams will actually, the beams will automatically try to hunt the person and actually bend themselves. They'll, they'll bounce off the walls trying to find the person, and they'll exchange information and transfer the information to the other beam. So what you see is it's actually, things are actually watching each, watching as you go with the beam steering. This is very important, very powerful. And so when we go to this, we're going to talk about, you pay this right on the other slides, is that we're going to go to a point where we're, we want to be able to do uh, various beam steering capabilities and various capabilities to do some other things. Uh, some, of the, some of the new advances in the, this 5G spec is basically we're going to do, do network uh, slicing. Network slicing means that on a particular waveform, I can have multiple entities doing different things and they're all secure. So our concept basically is we're going to take IoT from, let's say, the SCADA system and IoT from the F35, bounce them through the same free frame uh, comm network, but they'll be totally separate, totally secured themselves, so they'll never interact with each other. We can send them to different locations. This is where we get to multiple IoT sensors actually doing multiple things at the same time. So we talk about IoT sensors, we're talking about thousands of sensors out there and how we're going to manage those sensors and what they mean and where we're going to move the data to. And so we want to get to the point where we can actually do network slicing across the board, determine how we want the networks to actually work, and then determine what security parameters we want on those network slices. That is coming out. Okay, the major vendors, you can see the, up here where they're going to be. This is all tentative because, you know, everybody changes. You can't hold up to this. But you can see that uh, there's two types. There's broadband and there's also uh, basically uh, mobile. <coughs> and depending on where you are, you'll get either broadband or mobile. The mobile phones are coming out right now. You probably know it's in the Samsung, whatever, 10, was it 5G, whatever it's called. It's an expensive phone. <laughs> and the reason why it's going to be so expensive is because the 5G network for multiple vendors are at different frequencies. So this chip has to be a multi-frequency chip. <laughs> so you have to understand that. And as we get more and more frequencies, that are being utilized, this chip is going to get more and more powerful, which means the chip is more and more complex. We talked to the Qualcomm people, for instance, and they're going crazy with the chip because they're generating millions of chips a day, and they're pushing them out all over the place. But it's a very complex chip. So as we go forward, you'll see that depending on where you're going, you will change frequencies. And sometimes when we talk about how we're going to change it, we have to remember that the LTE network is going to be there for a while. So and the uh, complementary that for the Wi-Fi network is Wi-Fi 6. So as you go forward, you'll be into, with the problem space we're going to have is we're going to be in a 5G network at a particular point in time, network slicing away for our IT and any other devices we have, and all of a sudden you're going to go into an LTE network, which is slower, but again, the LTE network can be used to support some of the 5G capabilities and you go inside the building, it's going to be Wi-Fi 6. And Wi-Fi 6 is supposed to support all of the 5G capabilities. And they're all working. Everybody's working and trying to get this all standardized right now. So when you say 5G is coming, it's got a question is, what do you mean by 5G? And what frequencies are you going to have to 
actually utilize with this. And you can see there's, the vendors are all over the place, which is okay. Uh, and services are rolling out and it depends on where you are is what you get. Moving briskly along. Oops. How about this one? There you go. Okay. Uh, you probably know that uh, the satellite industry is going the same way. They're all going to offer 5G. And depending on the number of satellites and what orbit they're in, if you're in low orbit, you will look like you are using a 5G system. The issue is, of course, since there's some altitude there, you're going to have some delay factors. And so you have to understand that. And we talk about when we want to actually push, push a 5G system into a combat region, we're talking about we want to be able to go from a terrestrial also to a satellite if necessary and back again, depending on where you are. And so we, when you spend across the world, we're going to have to think about this this way. Now, when we get enough low orbit satellites in, and there's certain people who are actually building 5,000 satellites or planning 5,000 satellites in low orbit, it's going to cover the world. And so the question is, how are we going to manage going between the terrestrial to the, to the satellites to back down to terrestrial again, or are we going to keep on going that way, bouncing around? And we'll get to the airplanes, the same, another issue. Do we want to have 5G receivers on the airplanes? Some people are working on this right now. One company is working at it as a commercial venture, basically, to do this, <laughs> because they want to link the, the planes together. There's beam steering associated with it. And so for the way to be able to track the planes with the beam steering and move data around. This is a typical thing. Now, the planes, the planes are commercial. They're relatively slow compared to our planes. And so they can do that. But as we progress more and more capabilities, you're going to see that they're going to move faster. And so will the frequencies. And so will the changes to be made. OK, what is it? Uh, basically, you know, the services are offered as broad, broadcast services, TV, which is digital TV, will be very popular. And in fact, if you get 5G at your home, you could probably run all your, all your, everything you have on that line, whatever it is, because it'll be so fast. Again, you'll probably be charged for it, so get used to that, because the industry is going to have to make money. You have to understand that, that as you go forward, they're putting in a lot of infrastructure. And a lot of the infrastructure is going to be the backhaul. As you get more information in on the system, the backhaul has to be a supporting of that. So I'm just trying to understand that. The backhaul is very important, and when we get to you know, what we're doing in the Air Force, you'll see why it's important. It's because we do not want to buy the backhaul, per se. We want it to be given to us as part of a service. Uh, we talk about aircraft services, more connectivity, massive IT, high user mobility. And we get to you know, the, uh, the favorite one everyone wants to talk about is the, the automated cars and things. Uh, it's interesting because we've talked to a bunch of people about that. And it's a, I keep doing this, it's a question of how can you actually do cars and everything else associated with it. It depends how fast the car is going in actuality. Now, what you have is we've seen cars already implemented. All the cars have sensors all over the place. They're all communicating with each other throughout the waveforms. It's 5.9 gigahertz waveform. The issue is when you're speeding down the highway at 100 miles an hour, I'm great, guys don't go 100 miles an hour, but maybe Montgomery does. <laughs> DC, we go 25 miles an hour. <laughs> if you're lucky, yeah. It's trying to track, you have to track all the cars. The 5G capability has enough sufficient, sufficient bandwidth and everything to track all the cars at the same time. The issue becomes how fast can you actually do this and how close are your antennas? <laughs> And so that eventually you would have to get antennas almost every lamppost or every way you have it to start supporting the tracking of all the cars. And so if you want to go to the super highway where it should come out automatically and it's self-driving, this is what you're going to have to have. And it's going to take a while to get to that infrastructure. So just think of the, the problems with getting an infrastructure in place. Uh, we're doing several projects. We've done already before. And some of these you know about, like the uh, smart base we had it, we have it at Maxwell. That was one of the first projects that was, whoops. Oh, sorry about that. Keep on going to the place I want to go to. There's no other. Oh, let's talk about this one first, base network infrastructure. Uh, 
This, this, is, this is currently what we're currently doing. Okay. This is the, uh, we're trying to get uh, 5G LTE across all the bases in the Air Force. Uh, we took, we decided about two years ago that we needed to do this, and it's taken that long to actually get into place. Uh, we decided that it was going to, the standard process for getting LTE on an air base was a two plus year effort. <coughs> That's one base, two years plus. <laughs> If you started, we're trying to. We, we decided that was too too much work, and we know we had to get 5G because what happened was when we started doing our mobility panel, we said we have to do some mobility stuff. And the first question was, can't do mobility on an air base unless you have the network structure to support mobility at the Air Force. So we said we have to go LTE right away as fast as we can, not 5G. Moving to 5G. So about two years ago, we said we have to work with uh, civil engineering to actually develop the process to speed it up to get out of this two-year plus cycle of getting LTE on a particular airbase. And we worked with uh, civil engineering to speed up their prop paperwork. We now have come out with an, uh, a way to actually lease multiple bases, and the first lease has been to the southeast region for 10 bases. And we're doing this in a, base, in a group basis because what we want to be able to do is look at it from the viewpoint from the commercial industry. I'm giving you 10 bases. Some bases are not the best for your commercial side. Some bases are really good for your commercial side. So your return on investment across the multitude of bases of the cluster we're giving you should be okay. There's some other advantages too. The first one is that we are specifying exactly what areas we want covered on the base. And the evaluation criteria is basically you have to cover all the areas and all the bases that we have that we put in this cluster, and you also have to be able to show us the strength and the capability for each of those areas on the bases. And that's the main award criteria for doing this, which is unusual because that's not what everybody else wants to do. The second award criteria is we want to make sure that you're going to update the bases, update to the current standards. And after that, it's pretty much a wash as to what's really there. There's a question of speed, there's a question of some other things, but it's a question of making sure that we get the right capabilities at the bases when we need it. The other criteria is that we, will, we are not charging for a lease. This is unusual, <laughs> totally unusual. Uh, that's not the concern. The concern was mission. We want to be able to do mission at the bases. We'll take in-kind uh, in capabilities, whatever is likable, but that's not a criteria. The criteria is let's push it out there. The other big deal is that we now have authority to actually do the spectrum analysis for the entire cluster of the bases. So instead of doing a spectrum analysis for every base, which costs the vendor multiple dollars, 20,000 or so, they can now do it across all bases at the same time. And you get authority to across all bases at the same time. <laughs> Third thing is that the leasing is for multiple, multiple years, if you will. The maximum of certain maximum that a single base can offer is a five-year lease. For some industries, the five-year lease is not a good enough return on investment. So this can go up to, depending on civil engineering, what he wants to do with it, he can go up to a 25-year lease for all those bases. And so it'll be a, it usually will be a multiple year first time plus options continuing on or something. But understand, we wanted to make sure this was attractable, attractive to the particular commercial vendors because we said, we want to put it out there and put it as fast as we can. Okay, we've done 10 bases. They're almost ready to go. They're almost ready. To, the implementation is going to start for some of the bases by November or September, September or so. So we're going to get some capabilities at each of the bases pretty quickly now. The, the next set of bases we're going to do is we're going to do 15, probably 16 bases the next one. We've learned a lot from the first 10. It was a learning experience for civil engineering. They didn't know what to expect. Uh, uh, they're pretty much, we try to, we're trying to accelerate faster now. So we're trying to go 16, 17 bases is the next, and it's going to be the northwest region as opposed to anything else right now. And it's a lot of bases up there, but it's going to be, and you're going to see, um, can't release the base count yet, but it's a mix of bases that you probably don't want to go to, which is the really northern part of the United States, as well as some bases on the California side of the world. <laughs> so it's a swatch of bases that have good, a lot of population, and you would like to actually put your capabilities there in some bases that you don't want to do anything with. 
So we're going to spread it across that region. And it's going to be like 17 bases. And it's going to be the same philosophy. Uh, we're going to work with uh, the base commanders to determine the regions that we have to cover, determine the areas, and it's, and it's also it's, its mission, also for quality of life. So it's everything on the base that the person wants. We didn't want to go fence line to fence line because some bases, there's nothing out there about some of those fence lines. <laughs> So it's just a question of when we go to the base commander, we'll say, what do you want us to do and, and keep on doing it? And that's what you're going to say from that viewpoint. Let's see. I lost it. Okay. Okay, some of the, some of the other things we're doing, Maxwell, you should know about Maxwell, it's been here. It was a smart base pilot. This worked pretty well. Uh, it, figured, it finished, you know, last year. The real question that we came out with, we, we wanted to do some more with it. Uh, I don't know what everybody's wanting to do with it. The problem was that we didn't have fi good enough connectivity for some of the things we tried to do. So one of the lessons learned was, yes, we have to be able to actually have good network connectivity to actually go further with some of the stuff we want to go forward with. Some of the other stuff that we're doing is the flight line of the future. I'm sure you heard about this before. This is the, the how can I actually do maintenance on the flight line? Right now, you know, there is not good connectivity on the flight line, and so the maintenance personnel have to go back and actually bring manuals with them or bring a pad with them or whatever, but they cannot order parts on the line. And so the question is, is the logistics have been trying to put together a system where they can actually do everything with a device on the flight line. This is going to get more interesting because we talked about, okay, what else can you want to do on the flight line? And they were like, I want to order parts. I want parts automatically delivered to me. I want to be able to predict some things that are going to happen. And so it's a question of rolling in AI capabilities on top of this as well as some mobility capabilities if we really go that far. But right now they're planning to do a, an application that has to connect three different systems together into one application that's sitting on a phone or a pad as the case may be. And, and how you actually do this is what we want to be able to ca do capabilities for. Okay, and also there's some, there's some other things. The, uh, we'll probably get to this training piece. Training piece is Pilot Next. Pilot Next is we're currently doing, it's a, it's a joint European-NATO exercise for uh, training pilots. Now you notice this is a VR capability. When you go back to Pilot, to back to the, uh, the flight line in the future, we talked about doing uh, augmented reality capability as well as VR capability for the for the maintainers. To do that, you do need a 5G network. <laughs> There's no way around that. And so, as we're doing pilot next, as they're training themselves with a network, now we're talking about let's spread that across multiple areas of the world and try to have them work together. Of course, you need a very powerful network capability to actually do that with each other. So this is some of the capabilities we want to produce push out to the field is basically what AV, what capabilities do you want to do, augmented reality that you have to have out there right now. And so as you get to more VR and more, more of this, you're going to see more and more capabilities as we produce it out. Again, you need a 5G network. This is the whole problem that we've had all along that we knew we had. Okay. Now, this, is, this is Randolph with all the training. Is, is, there's a lot of training occurring at Randolph. Uh, Randolph may be one of the, the sites we actually do some more analysis with as to everything else as to, you know, how far we want to go with uh, the particular training capabilities for the 5G networks that we have. And I just want to put this up there and the slides come out later. This is the other part of it. Uh, this is when we talk about mission planning and training. Uh, this is one of the areas that, and I think I, let me, let me advance for one second, because I think this is going to be the DoD one. Yeah. Let's go back. Okay, this, this is back to the, to uh, doing, you know, Collaboration with, this is more like the uh, collaboration with the augmented reality and everything else associated with it. Yes. This is where we want to get to at some point. We're doing mission planning with everything else. 
and have our <coughs> coverage. Supply chain management is a big deal. We're trying to coordinate across how can you validate everything that's going in and out of the depots and everything else and how you're going to particularly push this out for warfighter operations and everything else. One of the things with the depots is we have, we have various ways of keeping track of all the equipment and everything else. In fact, one of the problems we have is like this, we have, we have a problem keeping track of tools that are being handed out to the, to the uh, maintenance people. And there's various ways we've actually put in tool, tool uh, automatic tool uh, lockers, if you will, where you've got to put in your cat card to actually get a tool up. <laughs> but we're getting to, we're to the point where we want to be able to track the tools in real time as opposed to anything else. And so one of the things we've been talking about is how would this actually work with with real, you know, t putting something on particularly too, like an RID chip and everything else and tracking it that way, as well as some other things in the depot. This is oh yeah, one of the other big areas is dynamic spectrum sharing. Um, th this is a, a big deal right now. Uh, DoD is trying to work in an environment now where you have to share the spectrum. Uh, DoD cannot keep on giving up spectrum, <laughs> even though FCC wants all the spectrum to be sold off. So there's an effort now to figure out what does dynamic spectrum sharing actually means and can DoD have prevalence in that spectrum when there's a mission that needs to be done. Now it, what we've done basically is we've gone and we're going to have a few, when you talk about DOD, and I think I have the experiment in here. Now let me go back a second. Okay. Probably should work this thing. The, let me go to this slide first and then we'll go back a second. Okay. Uh, DOD, what we're doing for DOD right now is we're working on, with DOD for uh, experimentation at each of the bases, at some of the bases. Uh, DoD has money established where they can now do a, um, various experiments, and the experiments that we want to do is basically depot operations, training, uh, planning, as well as uh, shared spectrum operations at several of the bases. DoD got together and they've worked with the National Spectrum Consortium uh, for solicitation of ideas and concepts for 5G going forward. They've come to the point where we now have 200 plus papers submitted to the National Spectrum Consortium. We've had airmen actually look at some of those and determine what are the best choices. They're narrowing it down to a set of RFPs that they will release out, out of the OTA to actually be done at each, to be worked at some experiments at each of the bases. Now, we do not know yet what the experiments are going to be because they haven't finished the analysis of all the 200 papers yet but they want to be able to have a practical capability of going forward with it. So you're going to see some experimentation at some of the bases. The, uh, since this is an OTA, it's an interesting experiment because it's going to be a multi-year probably experiment for some of the things that are going to be multi, it's going to be the same experiment at different bases as well as Army bases as well as Navy ports. So this is going to be across all of DOD. Uh, I'm the rep, no, no, no surprise. But uh, we've been working on this for about a ye half a year now, almost eight months. Uh, DoD has money to do this. In fact, they just got their $52 million for this particular effort to start. <coughs> and so it's not a trivial exercise, and they're going to get more money next year. And we were talking to the staffers on Friday about this, and yes, it's going forward as part of the NDIA for, <coughs> for uh, two. 2020, and so you're going to see this in the NDAA language. And so you're going to see some other things in the NDAA language about, uh, potentially about Nellis and some other things too, but we don't know the finalization of what that language would be. But there's going to be experiments all over the place. Now, I'm going to tell you that because what you're going to see is two, two trains of things we're trying to push. We're trying to push 5G and LTE at all the bases. Okay, you're going to have that occurring. You're going to have some experiments occurring based on the DDU effort. We expect the DUD experiments to be uh, more an experiment of what capabilities could be placed at the base. 
not necessarily supporting you know, any particular activity. We expect a lot of it to be training. We expect a lot of it to be network slicing. We expect some of it to be security. We expect some of it to be IoT. We don't know what it's going to be yet. So when we come to a base and we say, hey, we have an experiment for you, and it's with XYZ company, which is probably a small business somewhere, you'll understand that we're trying to figure this out as how we're going to put it on the base. Now, I may have multiple experiments at the same base, so if you get this request, just understand this is what's happening. The issue that we're going to have is that <clears throat> uh, we have to evaluate the experiments. And so we're going to depend upon the base personnel, you guys, to actually support it. <laughs> and we'll go to them and say, hey, we need your support. What's nice is DOD is actually going to spend money to actually support you guys at the base, <laughs> which is kind of interesting because they realize that nothing is free, that if you, want, if you want to have an experiment, you're going to have to do some work, and therefore, it'll drag the airmen into this, that support role, and pay, <clears throat> we'll provide some funding for that as well. So this is going to be a very interesting kind of concept of going forward with DOD. Uh, we have some other ideas, too, for the aerial layer that we're going to talk about. We talked about it with the Navy already of how they want to do it, and we'll see if that's part of one of the experiments. But it'll be a joint effort with the Navy and us as to some of the things we want to go forward with. So we'll see how that, that happens. Uh, what's going to happen is that the uh, RP should come out by, the, by probably November or so. Award will be next year. Uh, we'll see how many awards there's going to be. It depends upon the experiment. Uh, we've already written contract language for the RPs that all of the components, mill dips, have agreed upon for what has to be done and how much is going to be what efforts. What's going to be for us is going to have to understand this. It's a contract. It's an OTA. We are going to provide GFE equipment to them. GFE meaning <coughs> the network that exists, the electricity that exists, the uh, facility that they could possibly put themselves in as well as office space. If they have to build something else or do something else, they will have to pay for it as part of the contract. So if they have to extend uh, power, that's their job, not ours. We have to make sure that they <clears throat> are, are within the natural uh, regulations that are that for the power for the base. So <clears throat> it's going to depend upon us to do some work. I know it's difficult, but it's for the experiment purposes. Uh, and we expect that whoever is supporting it at the base will actually be the owner of it eventually at some point in time and may decide to go forward with it for further analysis. So it's a question of taking ownership of it. Since it's an OTA, we get all the equipment and we keep it all. This is a contract. And so we have to decide at some point in time if we're going to maintain it or not, which is another issue that we haven't talked about. Uh, let's see. What are things? OK. Let's go back up here one, one more. Uh, the depot operation, operation is interesting. Uh, some of these slides we put together basically for when we went to collaboration day for the 5G experimentations for DoD. But the depot operations maintenance is something that we've been trying to do for a while because there's multiple devices that talk to each other on the base or multiple devices that we have to move out information from. And so the issue is how can we usually actually do this again? And so you, you can tell that there's lots of ways of actually doing it and coming out with things and how we want to go forward with it. So the, the issue where we go forward with is that as we start doing the 5G on the bases all over the place, you're going to see a lot of hype basically saying it's going to happen really fast and it's going to be wonderful. It's not going to be fast and wonderful for a while. Just race that out of your minds. I mean, people are coming out with the antennas right now to support it. They're coming out with the base stations. What you're going to see is some evolution of capabilities. And as we evolve the capabilities, what you're going to see is many data centers at, the, at some of the base stations. We've talked about this because what, we wanna, what everybody wants to do is to say, we're going to move all the power, all the capabilities to the edge now. All the processing is going to be at the edge. The edge being the phone, the edge being the many data centers that are sitting at the base stations and the network. So you're going to see some capabilities of how we want to network slice use the many uh, data processing centers at the base stations to do all the work and then send information, only key information, backwards to some other places. So we're trying to move everything together. Also at the bases, 
for the 5G experiments. We do not know if they're going to use approved FCC frequencies. You may see frequencies all over the place. <laughs> Because it's an enclosed environment, they can use unauthorized frequencies in an enclosed environment. So if they want to get up to 60 gigahertz, then they can possibly do that. Now, at the same time, people are concerned about the capabilities against uh, how this will actually react to uh, personnel. <clears throat> at the same time, let you know, GIO is also doing an, an audit of us, of the components for 5G capabilities. We've already had a 5G vulnerability analysis performed. We've already uh, audited by them. We're doing a R&D audit with them right now. One of the concerns is that show me the biological effects of all these waveforms. So everybody's trying to get to the point where we can say, here's all the stuff, here's everything, it looks fine. We're pushing it out to the bases. You guys have to work with it. And so as we go through this journey, and it's gonna be a journey, believe me, uh, just keep abreast of what's actually happening. We'll try to produce things as fast as we can out there. Uh, I get a lot of queries since I'm the, seem to be the default 5G rep for the Air Force, for at least for DOD and for GAO now. <coughs> but uh, it's interesting that, that we actually can produce some of this stuff pretty quickly now. And actually we're trying to do some of the, you know, the, the uh, experiments and everything to get our mission done better. So with that, any questions, guys? Yes? So more of a comment than a question. So I, I'm in Park Hall at Cradle Point. It used to be with Nokia. So the NSC used to be what I managed while I was at Nokia Limited. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is the importance of what the work is being done in that sector of the story because there was a $1.25 billion OCA award in 2015, and a lot of that funding has been you know, given out to a lot of uh, industry. And so one of the things we look at in conjunction with the NSC was basically a flight line to airborne uh, network for uh, telemetry. So I mean, Edwards Air Force Base, obviously, you know, serial telemetry is, you know, bandwidth constrained and with the, you know, technology evolution of aircraft and all the information coming off of it, you know, they were looking for a different way to uh, do things. And so LTE was one of the ways that we tried to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. And, and we're involved, believe me. We have, like I said, we're involved, believe me, because we have meetings, we have DOD meetings like every other week. <laughs> so it's, it's a big push, and it's also a big push politically to actually get this out. And so you'll, you'll see that, in fact, I briefed the secretary twice already on 5G, and I'm sure it's gonna happen with the new secretary whenever she gets appointed, and uh, you know, we're gonna do this again and again, because it keeps on coming back up as to what, I mean, the, the concern is the, the vulnerabilities of, of the different vendors actually producing stuff, and we've talked about that already. And it's, it's a question of how we're going to go forward. What you're going to see is that we're going to, as I'm GA asked the question, what, have you done an availability analysis of the systems? And we're like, when we see the systems in real production, then we'll do the availability analysis. But until we see real systems in production that we can actually touch our hands on, we cannot do this. And so one of the issues is going to be, okay, show us what it is and we'll do the analysis. But a lot of the stuff is going to see, everything's going to be encrypted, all the data's going to be encrypted. We all decided that a long time ago. That's the way it should be anyways. And so it's, that's one of the tenants and the question that we have is for secure handoff. Well, devices are key and devices are key. 
Make sure you don't buy those strange end devices from China. Uh, because there's a lot of vulnerabilities, basically. It's on the open process ready with everything on the chip and everything else associated with it. So we're going to, to be careful about the end devices. We're going to be careful about exchanging between LTE and 5G networks. Uh, we're going to be careful about moving between, in Europe especially, because Europe has mainly gone all of Huawei. How we actually move through the European environment for our mission partners, as well as us who are out there, we're going to have to go through those networks and those capabilities. And so it's going to have to be a, a look at how we actually will do that in terms of uh, capabilities. And what you're going to see is the RMF is going to change a little bit and basically say, okay, if you have an application and it's going to go somewhere around, how is, what is the network that you're running on now and how am I going to ensure that that capability gets to the place it's supposed to be? Because mainly we're going basically back to a data application centric cap or viewpoint. The network is part of that application. And so you're going to see that being produced around a little bit. Okay, any other questions? Comments? Support? Yes? Yes, sir. Thank you, Potter. Um, <laughs> yes. The, the potential <laughs> touch points between the rollout of this and rollout of ITES over the next couple of years? Good question. Don't know. <laughs> it's, we, we try to make ourselves independent of the two because one is a, you know, we're trying to push it up to every base. Uh, there, there is some overlap. Uh, the question will be, do, you, do they want to use the commercial 5G capability we're pushing out there or not? Remember, we want to go commercial because we didn't want to pay for the backhaul. <laughs> this, is, this is the key, especially when we go to you know, North Dakota, guess what, the backhaul is going to be really expensive. <laughs> so it's, it's an issue of, uh, we want everything as a service, the commercial industry provides it as a service to announce that we want commercial. We want specialized services, that we're going to have to figure out how we're going to pay for them and how are they going to interact with them. But since uh, ETAS is a risk reduction effort as we're going through this, uh, we will probably, I mean, the intent is to get most of the Air Force bases done with them, I hopefully at least allocated within two years or so. Because the next swatch, this is 15, the next swatch will be maybe double that, maybe 30 bases. So that'll be 30 plus 15 plus 25, that's, that's 60 bases or so, 70 bases. So, and there's some bases we can't do. Some of the reserves and guard are sitting at airports. <laughs> we don't own the airports, we can't lease the airports. <laughs> so a lot of it's, you know, real bases and things. Anything else? Yes? We, we've talked, we talked about integrations with the base networks, but we have to figure out how we actually want to do that. There's some ways of, there's, there's various ways of doing chipsets and things. And so it's a question of, do you want a, a dedicated device to go to your network or not? <laughs> or you want a generic? A lot of times generic is easier. Sometimes there's ways of switching it dynamically at the base. And so we're gonna play with those technologies when they come out. Okay, anything else, anybody? Well, thank you. Ah, another person. We we all want that. <laughs> uh, it's a security issue. <laughs> we're working on that too. That's another. That's another issue. We're working on that one. Okay. Thank you, everybody.